I feel like we've been hearing an awful lot about the spring offensive. Is there spring offensive happening now? What, what is going on? The spring offensive we've already talked about for both sides. They, the challenge has been for Russia. They've almost gone across the start line early, and partly that appears to be out of fear of what the Ukrainian spring offensive might bring, because that's when the tanks are going to come in. The Russians have no answer to that. And what the Russians have been doing, even though the weather isn't suitable, so they've been confined to road, it's muddy and really difficult, they've thrown the kitchen sink at trying to get some sort of progress, primarily along the eastern front, and actually, frankly, they've made very limited progress at all. And almost certainly, they've run out of steam and they've been redeploying their Russian forces now uh, away from that front line in response now because they fully expect in the coming weeks the Ukrainians are going to start to push and they need to be prepared for that. If we look actually at what's happening on the ground at the moment, the Ukraine claims that they've uh, repelled 80 attacks over the last 24 hours. There's been intense shelling all over the place, um, but it's not just the military that die in this, unfortunately. Uh, innocent civilians get caught up as well. Reports of uh, two uh, civilians dying and seven injured uh, in uh, Bilyanka, and that was... Uh, we, we had some video footage of that, and it was just devastating, the effect on, on the village there. There's also the Russian military... Uh, the missile attacks have decreased significantly over the last few weeks, probably because Russia's running short of those missiles. The Ukrainian claim that two missiles are heading for Odessa down by you uh, was shot down uh, overnight. Unfortunately, one got through at Kostyanka Nivitka here, um, and that unfortunately hit a, uh, an invincibility point. Now, that is a Ukrainian initiative that's designed to provide protection for civilians. Um, it's got heat, water, and, you know, some basic uh, utensils. Unfortunately, that hit took three, three women got killed, and it looks likely several more will have been injured. It's just a reminder, isn't it, as you said, of the absolute destruction to civilian life, to life in Ukraine, yeah. you know, as everyone knows it. Um, I'm interested to talk about the Wagner Group because it feels like this is a kind of fascinating sort of underbelly, I guess, to the war. Uh, because just to, right, who's this guy? What, what's going on? Yeah, Genny Prigozhin, who's the head of the Wagner Group. He was a convicted thief. And he's now become the head of the Wagner Group, a bunch of mercenaries, and does a lot of dirty work around the world mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of President Putin. If you recall that um, the fighting, uh, the Russian army wasn't doing very well, particularly in the Bakhmut area, they brought in these guys and they have made progress, albeit slow. Because they were making progress, his influence started to rise. He was very critical of the Russian leadership, particularly the army. Um, and all of a sudden, President Putin started to feel threatened. He denied him access to the prisons where he was getting convicts, his recruits, uh, and he also denied him some ammunition. Now, of course, they were at the front line of Bakhmut. Ammunition is essential. So all of a sudden, his language has definitely softened towards the Kremlin. But at a recent long interview that he did, it's evident he's not a political monster, he's a military monster. And in this interview, he said very publicly, it goes out on their state television, the fighting in Ukraine um, that was actually against Ukrainian soldiers, nothing to do with NATO. He said that they've not encountered any Nazis in Donbass at all. And he also said that the new Russian borders need to be defined pretty quickly because the Russian forces were running out esteem. All those messages run completely mm. counter to Putin's. Now, we always wonder who speaks truth to power in Putin's Russia. He's an unlikely candidate to do it, but it'd be really interesting to see how this messaging docks. And you do often see, don't you, the kind of military leaders perhaps becoming, playing a role in the downfall of some of the leaders too? I mean, obviously, we, maybe well, that's... Well, it's particularly interesting here because what are his agenda? Yeah. He's, a, he's a convicted... Uh, he's a convict and actually he deploys all over the world and actually he will have his own business interests that have nothing to do with Russia in this conflict. Fascinating to see the role of private military organisations which are illegal in Russia being funded by Russia in the war in Ukraine. That's really interesting. Um, What's the latest when it comes to uh, weapons, quickly? Because there's been a lot of talk about what, what we're giving, what, what we should be get doing. Well, there was a lot of talk uh, no, the other day. We're giving Challenger 2 tanks. Mm -hmm. They use a depleted uranium round because it's very good at getting through armour. President Putin's turned around and said, that, that is now, it's nuclear because it's uh, uranium, therefore that, that will trigger a, a nuclear war. And let's be clear, that the uranium-235, which is the main uh, element of nuclear weapons and nuclear power stations, highly radioactive. A uh, piece of uranium is what's left when you finish that. It's not highly radioactive. It's got alpha particles which can't even get through your skin. It's only dangerous if you ingest it or, 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 or breathe it in. And even then, it's because it's poisonous, not because of the radiation at all. What's interesting particularly is that Russia actually uses depleted uranium in some of their weapons as well. So this is nothing more than Putin's rhetoric again and scaremongering.